Charles Hot Soul, bitch. Bring him on. I prefer a straight fight caller sneaking around. I don't know where you get your delusions, laser brain. Oh, come on, bro. It's the wars. So here we are, week two of Andor. And I was reminiscing today. Remember when Star Wars TV was a pipe dream? This is the Wars and More. I'm Joe. Of course, with me is my good buddy Doug. Hey, Doug, how you doing? Doing pretty good, Joe. How you doing? Doing all right. Doing all right. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Like, it just it couldn't be done? Well, Too yeah. Too expensive. Uh, yeah, live action, right? We're talking live action because, you know. Right. George did manage to do some animation. Yes, yes. I guess I should have been more specific. But, you uh, know, yeah, but, yeah. the intro. Time, right? Time. Right. Yeah, so live action TV was like, no way. Never be able to do it and have it feel like Star Wars. It's just too expensive. Right. Here we are. Here we are. They're pumping them out. <laughs> That's for sure. And ironically, I I think they're paying what George Lucas was like, ah, no, we can't pay that. Oh, I know. I, but I think the difference is just, you know, streaming, right? Streaming is the difference maker. That's for There's sure. Just more money in it. Because that, that right there was one of the big issues I think George was wrestling with was the distribution model. I mean, you know, you have to get with a a network or whatever, you know, and then you have to sign deals and it's got to be, you know, and that was just too much, you know, whereas streaming services, you know, have made it easy. I mean, seasons of shows now are eight, 10 episodes, 12, right? They used to be 26, you know, and I'm sure... 10 years ago or whatever it was, George was thinking in those terms still, you know? Well, that's true. That's true. If he's trying to make a full TV season, right? Right. Which, I mean, if you're going to get picked up by a network back then, that's what you had to do. It's exactly right. Yep. And then, you know, and not only that, you're just, you're fighting over shares of ad revenue. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, it's wild. It is wild. Things have changed. <laughs> Even though... Even though the the shares of ad revenue is coming to uh, Disney Plus, right? They're adding a um, a tier of the service that has ads, right? Which to hell with that! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. I'll pay for none of that. Thank you. Yep. Happily. But the problem with that is, it's like okay, we we pay this now, right? Like, yep. You know. Ours will probably go up. Right. And then that one will probably be a little less right. than what we're paying now. Dumb. Yep. <laughs> Dumb. Like, it blows me away because this is the whole allure of streaming, right? And I know this is a little bit of a sidetrack. But, right. But this is the whole allure. Absolutely. Binging stuff. Yeah. And no ads. Yep. And now here come the ads. Yeah. And being on the streaming service, it's going to bypass my dealing with TV ads method, which was recorded on my DVR and fast forward through. Yeah, that's that's the way around that, isn't it? I mean, they've been trying to circumvent TiVo since like 1998. No, here we are. It's <laughs> right. <laughs> they've done it. Finally. This was the evil plan all along. Right. If we put it on an ad service, they care on a streaming service. Yep. There's nothing they can do. Ha ha ha. <laughs> well, welcome back, piracy. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. Back on track. Right. We don't back condone on. piracy. That's... Yeah. Piracy bad. Don't yeah, do it. Exactly. But that's what's going to bring it back. Right? Yeah. Man, most likely. All right. So before we get to Andor, let's let's, let's go let's go over some of the other things that are going on. Okay. Um, so Bob Iger and John Williams awarded honorary knighthoods. Yes. So apparently, the two of them are uh, some of the final honorary knighthood awards issued by Queen Elizabeth II. Right. Um. Which. Yeah. You know, I mean, 
awesome. I don't know. For me, I just, I, I, you know, how do I put this without coming across the wrong way? You know, she's thinking, hey, this is one thing I got to do, right? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm blown away that John Williams didn't have one already. Yeah, really, when you think about it. I mean, all his work with the London Symphony Orchestra. And yes. Doing, uh, Star Wars, Harry Potter, and, you know, especially like Harry Potter being a, you know, uh, English centered story, right? Right, right. Well, really, you said it in passing there, all his work with the LSO. I mean, right. that should be what it is all about, you know? I mean, uh, some, oh, absolutely. some might consider, you know, Movie music, lower brow than, like, you know, symphony. But, I mean, this is John Williams. He brought high brow into film, so. Right. I don't know. Like, when you're talking, like, films with, you know, symphonic scores, right? Do you really consider it low brow? Like, I think some people do. I mean, I don't. But yeah, I mean, go see your local symphony. They're going to play something from film. A lot of times. Yes. And a lot of the other stuff has its its center in uh, theater. But it's theater. Finger up. <laughs> right. Pinky up. Yeah. Yeah. Theater. Yeah. I guess the one bummer for these guys is that they're not going to be able to be called sir. Which, I don't know. If I met John Williams, I'd say, hey, nice to meet you, sir. So I guess it's okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, they just can't use it as a uh, prefix. A title, yeah. I mean, uh, that would be illegal anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. A real knighthood would be against the law for United States citizens. Right. So I just well, want a sword, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And John Williams should get a lightsaber. Just saying. Yeah, does it come with a sword and a signet ring? It better. Like, do you get a crest? Heck yeah. So that's cool. It is cool. I mean, that kind of thing. mainly the John Williams part for me, but you know, very cool. Right. I'm with you there. <laughs> All right. James Earl Jones. Right. So James Earl Jones is pulling back. Yeah, winding down, voicing Darth Vader. So, you know, this is something that's, I think we all kind of had to know yeah, look, Sometimes coming. people just want to retire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, the guy's, what, 91, I think? And uh, it's like, maybe it's time to slow down a little bit. Yeah, I guess the concern for all of us is that, you know, are they going to be able to reproduce his work, you know, moving forward? And I'd I say, that, yes. what's that? It's, uh, I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah, exactly. I think we have uh, a good example from Obi-Wan Kenobi. So, uh, which, uh, you know, according to this uh, interview that uh, Matthew Wood did with, Vanity Fair, uh, you know, James Earl Jones was uh, heavily involved in, uh, like, this transition, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's, it's, you know, I like that because he's, like, still concerned about the legacy of the character, you know? He's like, I'm kind of done doing it, but, you know, let's make sure it's done right. So that's cool. Um, You know, being the voice actor that he is, I mean, the, just the availability of source material to use. Yes. And in, in reconstructing his voice. Right. I'm sure in all honesty, he's like, where was this 20 years ago? <laughs> exactly. Cause, yeah. Cause I'm sure he's still going to get paid. I'm sure he's going to get something, you know, he's licensing the likeness of his voice, something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's probably not going to be as much as if he were actually in studio, but,
but well, I'm sure. you know, yeah. Still, if I could like, yeah, just keep getting money for something you did before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, the company that uh, you know uh, Matthew Woods working with on this is uh, Respeecher, and they are located in Kiev. So, uh, you know, they, they started all this work, you know, back on Obi-Wan Kenobi and this, this article, I'm, I'm not going to belabor all this, you know, or bring us all down, but you know, he was talking about how, uh, there might've been 50 lines of Vader dialogue and in a, a show and, uh, he would have like, he says, Upwards of 10,000 back and forths with Reese Beecher and himself about little tweaks and little, uh, you know, adjustments made to the voice, you know, just to make it sound more authentic and everything. And, you know, he's like, he started pulling back on that once these guys were like, you know, lining bookshelves over the windows and stuff, and <laughs> going into corridors and the inner parts of the buildings to make sure that they could keep working while you know, chaos is going on all around them. So, right. But, uh, you know, I would say even though James Earl Jones is going to step down, I think, uh, I think we're going to be in good hands with, you know, I, I would say you could still do, you know, what we've talked about in the past is like a Vader centric show. Like we're getting with Andor and stuff, you know, could happen. Right. And I think the cool thing here is to like, they're in a situation right now where they get his blessing. Right. Right. So he's, he's, he's blessing this. He's, he's given his permission to keep doing this. Yep. So, um, I think that's a, that's a awesome situation right now. Cause I mean, there was always the question of like, uh, like ethically, is it all right? Right. Like, right. Yeah. You know, when they were doing the Tarkin, for example, yes. Yes. You know, there there was an ethical question there and you know, I I I think this is this is awesome that like now that this technology's here with characters like Darth Vader, you know, this this is so iconic. Like recasting this is I mean, how do you do it and pull it off and and, and, yeah. and the risk there, right? Exactly. Um that's always the concern, especially with Star Wars fans, right? Oh yeah. Cuz it's not like Star Wars fans are picky or finicky or anything. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I've always thought, you know, recasting's fine. Like, sure. You know, if the story's good, you can suspend disbelief, right? Yep, absolutely. So, um, but this is this is awesome that here they can they can get ahead of this, right? They were able to get ahead of it before he was like, "No, I'm done for good." Exactly. So. I mean, the last thing he'd want to be like, oh, yeah, we got these plans for Vader. And he's like, nah, I'm done. I'm retired. Yeah. Yeah. I'm walking away. I don't want anything to do with it anymore. Like, uh oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is this is a cool, cool thing. Yeah, totally. All right. So Tony Gilroy. Right. Apparently his initial pitch for Andor was rejected. Yeah, that's what he says. Now, he <laughs> apparently he's talking to the Hollywood Reporter, you know, and uh, uh, that's the headline here. This is, I'm not sure what to make of all this that he's saying. <laughs> to put it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's like, uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure if I'll get through this whole thing, but. Well, we don't have to go through the whole thing. I mean, geez, the guy. I, <laughs> cool but he talks a lot right yes this is true and 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 it's like circling around what he's trying to say <laughs> you know what i'm saying but it's like i had a i had an interview last week that we discussed and i parsed the crap out of that right <laughs> because he is long-winded he likes to talk yeah which is cool which is cool um you know now that we know this, you can definitely trick this guy. Yeah. 
So, okay, he goes, they tried to do a couple of different versions of this show along the way. I wasn't really interested, but the people that were trying it were feeling a little bit trapped in what we dis- had just discussed, this reverence for Star Wars, which, that's a head-scratcher for me, you know, to be honest about it. But, trapped in? Yeah. Trapped in what we just discussed, this reverence for Star Wars, Right. We, we've heard Tony Gilroy talk about this, you know, Andor is a show that just so happens to be in Star Wars, right? It's not a Star Wars show. So I'm I, starting to wonder, is like, is Tony Gilroy like worried that this is going to hem him in, right? Like I, he's going to get the, the franchise curse. I wonder if he's feeling that way too. And, you know, I don't think he's got anything to worry about. I mean... His catalog leading up to this is, you know, stellar. So, is it? uh, I didn't know who the hell he was before he 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 did like some of the Bourne stuff, Jason Bourne stuff. So okay. So, um, going on, uh, but they were also kind of inhibited because the economics weren't really in place for large scale streaming at that point. Uh, the economics to make a show like this, there wasn't anybody who was going to spend that kind of money on a show. Now there's a bunch of aircraft carriers that are floating around. This is becoming a normal thing. I don't understand, but okay. Um, aircraft carriers? I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so apparently Kathleen Kennedy sent him something uh, for a pilot that they were looking to start and got his feedback on it. And, uh, you know, he told him all kinds of stuff that he wouldn't do and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So they went back and pulled this old memo and they were like, we want to do this now, you know, meaning and, or I guess they wanted to be that ambitious on th- this scale. And the timing was right for me. I had a bunch of other things fall apart. I was getting a little tired of things falling apart. And the one thing that they definitely have is an audience. So it wasn't an overnight thing that you tiptoe into. It takes a long time. Everybody tiptoes forward, but that's how it came to be. So wait a second. (laughs) Hold on a second. Uh So he says, I was tired of things falling apart. Right. So your idea is. I need stability in my life, so I'm going to go do Disney Star Wars. Right. Because there's no way that's going to fall apart. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's just no precedent for that. No. None. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny uh-huh. when you really think about it. Right. Okay. But, it, I mean, that right there just... To be honest, it sounds to me like they were kicking around some ideas, you know, early on. I mean, didn't he come in because things were falling apart? Well, originally, <laughs> yes, time. exactly. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, here it sounds to me like it's like, okay, what he had going on, that went away. And it's like, well, okay, I guess I'll do this thing, you know. You know, right time, right, right place, right time. Okay. I, I, it's, it's just the way it seems. I don't know. It's weird. I mean, well, weird. I, this this whole notion of original pitches being rejected almost sounds to me more like, you know, kicking ideas around early on, you know? So, right. yeah. So maybe a little overreaction to yeah we like this but we don't like this right that's a rejection yeah exactly exactly which okay that's the impression i get anyway i don't know it's kind of weird but he he seems to be pretty firm on this whole you know don't look at it like a star wars thing you know so talking to the wrong audience brother exactly yeah Interesting. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Well, on to Andor. Yes. 
I mean, we've been talking Andor, but on to the episode. Right. We're talking about the fourth episode, which I believe had a title, right? It did. I, mean, I think they've all had titles. We just didn't address that last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. So this one is called Aldani, right? Yes, I believe it is, yes. All right. What'd you think? Fourth episode? Um, We're clearly still building up to something here, you know? Um, You know, we're actually seeing some results and consequences of things that have already happened. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all leading to something larger, I think. Right. I think, uh, now we discussed timeline, right? With, uh, season one, season two, season one being a year. Right. Right. So I can't imagine that this is going to drag out. I believe we're probably going to see a conclusion next episode. As far as the one mission they're, they're, they're go- currently on, currently on very possible. Yeah. Well, because if they're if they're supposed to be covering covering a year of his life, um, they can't drag out five days too long, right? I I'm I'm guessing what they might mean by that is that, like, it's all set in the same year. Maybe yeah, maybe they're covering a major event from this year. You know what I mean? All right, could be that way. Yeah, maybe should have said yeah, it's gonna cover a year. <laughs> it's like, well, it was the same year. Yeah, it was the same event. Right. But, uh, I mean, I imagine we're we're reaching a point where the pace is going to pick up. Yeah. Because if it don't, one, we're watching the longest movie I've seen in my life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's good. I, I am not complaining. Don't don't take that as a complaint. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's – where was I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we we meet his crew, right? That, that he's setting up with here. Um, what do you think of the crew? It's they they, they definitely aren't happy. No, with adding a member three days before, right? They're supposed to act. I will say this: this crew reminds me of other crews that we've seen in in the past, right? You know, maybe uh reminiscent of the crew from like the matrix or something right after right. neo joins that crew you know some people like him being there others are like take him or leave him or not real crazy about him you know that sort of thing so i i, I got those kind of vibes from that crew uh yeah so you know one thing i will say i didn't like that- is they talked about roles right and him being Oh, he could fit any role. Yeah. Yeah. What are their roles? Right. I, I mean, I, 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 they just kind of hammered on the role thing, and he could fill in for everybody. So, and, yeah, uh, uh, an easy way to satisfy that would have been when the introductions were going down. You know, this is Nemec. He's the wheel man. You know, uh, here's our, our enforcer. Pilot. This is our tech guy. This it, is- exactly. Yep. Here's our slicer. You know, which... Which is like standard, right? Like, yeah. So yeah. it would be like doing the same old, same old, but at the same time, it scratches I, I, that itch that you're feeling right now. It, yes, because like I said, they they put a lot of emphasis on the role. Yep. That he could play, and and him being a backup for everyone, because you know he can shoot, he can pilot, he can you know lie. Yep. So like he's he's coming in to be the the guy that steps in if anyone falls right but we don't know what everyone else does i mean i guess the one that we kind of have a uh kind of a handle on is this uh cinta right cinta cintra whatever i think it's cinta right uh i'm assuming she's a medic right makes sense right and we know uh Bell's the leader. Right. But other than that, I mean, is Nemec just the rookie? And it's, it's, you get that impression, right? I mean, you know, falling asleep on the job, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, 
you know, and both of the other guys actually kind of seem like enforcer types, you know? Right. So, like, I kind of had a hard time picking out who's the pilot, who's... Well, it almost looks like uh, Cassian's going to be the pilot now. Hey, can you fly one of these? Sure. You know? Okay. Yeah, and if they didn't have a pilot, their reluctance to take him on is a really bad idea. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Gorn's obviously the infiltrator, right? But he's the... he's. I'm assuming a turncoat. Right. Like, it's not like you join up and become a lieutenant. Yeah, exactly. So I'm assuming he's a turncoat. I would have to agree there. So, yeah, I just would have liked a little more. A little more background, a little faster. Right. Because, you know, you're you're having conversations around the fireside with these characters, but we don't know who they are. Exactly. And then sometimes, you know, you have that fireside chat. Now you know who you're dealing with. That didn't happen. Right. So between the introductions and their fireside chat, I still have no idea who these characters are. Right. And I was a little, a little miffed by that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I agree. Except, you know, here's this iPad. Learn all this. <laughs> that was funny. It was a Gen 1, too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, all right. Um, It was kind of neat to see a Kyber crystal. Yeah. I know I know, went out of order here. This That's all right. Before the crew, but that one was like a little thorn in my side there. Um, but yeah, another Kyber crystal. So another real nod to Rogue One, really, right? Yeah, because Jin had a Kyber crystal necklace. Right. This one was a little different. A little different. He called it a Kuwati signet, blue Kyber, sky stone. So, so whatever that means. I also, don't know. uh, referred to the Rakata, right? So. Yeah. So more uh, EU stuff uh, being pulled in. Right. I mean, I think the Ricotta were an explanation for some of the artwork and stuff, right? In in live action. So from the films. What do you mean? I think there was some artwork in one of the films that it was explained away as being something Ricotta. Oh, okay. I could be wrong on that. Okay. Just trying to think of any other um, canon references to Ricotta. Right. I don't recall any. Maybe some in Rebels. Maybe. I just thought it was cool that that was brought in there. Yeah, it is cool to see uh, some of this stuff, you know, eke its way in, you know, from here and there. Well, yeah, I guess since we're there, we might as well just do the, the kind of easter egg rundown right yeah it, let's do it because this was this was something that uh if if you were just watching for watching's sake a lot of this would pass you by but well and the funny thing is it's all in one sequence right like yes i mean it's like this stuff here were, was other easter eggs elsewhere but it's, it's one sequence was really heavy it's the perfect spot for it though when you think oh about yeah it. Oh yeah, so he's he's got this like historic art gallery, right? Right, artifact shop, and and, and referring to uh, Luthen. And I got to be honest, the other ones I had to I had to look stuff up, right? Like, oh yeah, I figured there was more. There was only one that stood out to me, right? That I caught it at real speed. And and, and okay, that, full huh? transparency, full transparency. I didn't pay attention to any of it until you mentioned the one and then it kind of like snowballed. So, right. Yeah. The one, the one stuck out to me and it's the only one I saw. And then when I started looking at it, I'm like, Holy crap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I guess I really should have paid attention. Cause like, duh, yeah, why yeah. wouldn't there be right here? Right. Exactly. So, uh, the one I caught, was uh, when he's showing the uh, Utapauan uh, monk cudgel. Yep. 
um, over his shoulder, there's a set of armor. Yep. Right. Yep. And right away, I'm like, dude, that looks like Star Killer's armor in the Force Unleashed. <laughs> and I looked it up and was like, whoa, that was that's right. That that's definitely his helmet. The armor itself, eh. Right. There's some resemblance right. in places, but the helmet for sure. The helmet's spot on. Yeah. Spot on. Definitely a, a full on nod to Star Killer and the Force Unleashed games. Right. So that was that was super cool. And then since I looked that up to verify for myself, I saw all these other ones. Yes. <laughs> And men are there a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because you brought that up and we just, you know, I just started watching the scene over again and it's like, oh, look, there's that. And there's that. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. I think you pointed out the, uh, the Ryloth, uh, Calicori, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that Ryloth family heirloom. Right. That kind of has their family tree on it. Yep. So yeah, that's kind of neat. And and um, given Thrawn's interest in the, and this is this is where I was like, oh, it makes sense that they would use this one for sure because Thrawn was so enthralled by that thing. Right. He he found it to be such a interesting piece. It's true. So I was like, oh yeah, you got to put that in there. Yep. Biggest Thrawn seal of approval. <laughs> and he is an art guy. Yeah, he'd love this shop. Oh, he'd love it. Especially like the throne in the in the books, right? He was going to art galleries. Right. And museums and stuff. So yeah, and uh I guess we'll keep going. There's a I'll start pointing these out here. Yeah. There is a piece there's pieces of the mural right. from Lothal. Yes. Yeah. The whole world between worlds thing. This this would be pieces of the mural with uh, the, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the name of that place. Um, but it had the father, the brother and the sister from Mortis Mortis. Yes. So yes, it looks like, uh, pieces of the facade that, you know, actually kind of changed and, and, uh, you know, showed Ezra, Ezra the way into this temple and all in, into the world between worlds. Um, cause we, you know, if you remember from rebels that kind of crumbled and, uh, looks like we definitely have pieces of that here, which is kind of cool, you know, although again, it's, <laughs> there's also something reference, which I don't think was there, but, uh, this seems like the sort of thing the emperor might, you know, if he knew that was there, he might want that. You know what I'm saying? Yes. In fact, didn't he, maybe it wasn't, it wasn't that mural, but he had some stuff on that ship that he lured Ezra onto. Yes. Right? Yes, he did. So he was definitely collecting stuff. Right. Um, another thing that's mentioned while looking this up is, is they mentioned Jedi and Sith holocrons. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing I was thinking uh, or, or was saying. I don't think that was the case, but yeah. Right. And looking at these, you look behind them. The, these are back there, and they do absolutely look like holocrons. Right. Except for one thing. They're massive. Right. They're at least as big as your head. It's, right. <laughs> and, you know, from all of the representations of holocrons we've seen in the past, they're not that big. No. I mean, they, they would fit in your hand. Yeah. And how could a, a a shopkeeper have holocrons and not be like executed by the emperor? You right. Know? I mean, that's the sort of thing I think you would want to keep uh, in private. And not only that, but force users would be able to feel the presence yeah. of a holocron, right? Totally. And if you had these on Coruscant at a time where the Jedi are eliminated. Yep. So different uh force sensitive or force empowered things 
would definitely be noticeable to someone as powerful as Palpatine, right? A- absolutely. There would be so little of the Force around that anyone sensitive to it, yeah, could hone yeah, There right would be no it. distortion to, to hide it. Exactly. Right? So, yeah, I don't think they're they're true holocrons. They may be art representing, you know, something someone didn't understand. It's very possible. Or art that uh, some of these, like, uh, tribal groups that, you know, worship the Sith of old. Right. Because in the EU, there was a lot of that, right? Where, yeah, absolutely. Where there were groups that worshipped a Sith Lord. Yep, totally. As a, as a god, even. Um, or their novelty lamps. Yeah. <laughs> Could very well be. <laughs> I want a holocron lamp. I, it's probably going to be a thing after that. Yeah. Like, Hey, those things look pretty good. Big. Yeah, exactly. So I think it was just a way to fit. I mean, cause yeah, it definitely represents holocrons, right? You got the square light side holocron and the triangular dark side holocron. Right. So, yeah, cool. Definitely represented the artwork and all that stuff, but yeah, too big. Right. Way too big. Um, it's funny saying it like that. I don't think they're real holocrons. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then here's an interesting one. In the back room, there is <laughs> yeah. a row of carbonite items, right? Items in carbonite. Right. You see and the slabs, yeah. Yeah, the slabs. Um, the frontmost one, I, I I can't clearly see it, but it does look like what people are saying it is, which is a coiled up whip. Right. So a nod to Harrison's two biggest roles, right? Exactly. Which, when you think about it, is appropriate. Makes sense. Oh, it's fabulous. Yeah. Oh, and, and I, not to overshadow that, but... but we're also leaving out the, the, the most obvious one, which was the Mandalorian armor. Right. Yeah. That was up in the front room. Yep. Which I didn't see because I went right to the the armor behind that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of stuff that's, uh, if you're looking for it, it's funny because I'm not even sure that Tony Gilroy understands all what was sitting in that room. He was, you know, it's like, hey, guess what? Whether you want it or not, you're steeped in Star Wars here. I mean, maybe that was a concession, though. Oh, sure. I mean, it doesn't affect his story, you know, at all. But right. it's it's something for all of us who who uh, want to go over this with a fine tooth comb. Neat little Easter eggs for sure. I'm excited to see what else people pick out, like because. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that there's some people's uh, depth of knowledge far deeper than ours is going to be like, hey, there was this and there was this, you know. Right. All right. So the ISB, right? Ah, yes. So they're dealing with the aftermath of, of what we saw in the first three episodes. Yeah. Yeah. Cleaning up the mess, so to speak. Cleaning up the mess. Um. Yeah, it didn't end well for... Uh, the three higher ups of the corporate security forces there. Right. Um, I'm actually surprised they're alive in all honesty. Yeah. They're just like, Hey, you're relieved. I'm not entirely convinced that they're done with them. Like the ISB, you know, everything that they were, they were talking about, uh, you know, they're, they're going through their offices and, and, you know, all their documents and all their things and, all of that kind of stuff. It wouldn't surprise me if, uh, you know, they, they, they did say, uh, and what was his name? Blevin, uh, said, you know, look, you're permanently under the jurisdiction of the empire now here. So exactly what Karn's supervisor did not want to happen, happened. Yes. So, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, 
found some stuff on these guys and um, tried to go after them. I mean, uh, Kern is a character that <laughs> he, I'm still up in the air, but I got a feeling we're going to see this guy. Like, I, I think he's seen the Empire and what he was striving for and all that. He's seen it for what it really is now. Yeah, but I mean, he clearly botched this thing. <laughs> There's no doubt. But I mean... I mean, his... His <sighs> pursuit in the beginning was obviously competent. You know, he, he, he was competent in, in tracing it all down and... Right. Pinning it on Cassian. Right. Um, But his execution was poor. <laughs> right. But that's not what the ISB is concerned with, is it? No. The ISB is just concerned with the fact that you failed, so you're done. Right. You know? And I think that's what's really going to co- hit home with them. Right. You you allowed an event to happen that would empower people on the cusp of rebellion. Right. If they start to see people succeeding against the Empire and the Empire's lackeys, yep. it's going to be empowering. Right. So they need to make sure that when events like this happen, they're getting stamped out. Yep. So, and this, this event showed a much broader willingness to rebel against the, the overlords, so to say. Oh, with the, by, uh, by the people of Ferrix, you mean? Yes. Yes. By, by, yeah, by the, the community at large. Right. They all kind of pitched in. Right. I, I got a feeling that we're going to see a heavier hand here, too, from the Empire as opposed to the corporate authorities, you know? Right. So we talked about Karn's ambition, right? Right. Um, he was obviously ambitious. Execution was lacking. But we were also introduced in this episode to uh, Deidre uh, Miro. Right. So another highly ambitious character. Right. And I'm sure this is just a a theme in the the hierarchy of the empire, right? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, you see it at the highest levels. You right. Know, Tarkin and Krennic and you know all of it, yeah. Well yeah, I mean and, and you're seeing ambition out of Tarkin and Tarkin's already highly elevated. Exactly. Right? Exactly. He wants more. He wants to be the right hand. Right. So, um, yeah, I have a feeling that that interaction between uh, Deidre and uh, Blevin, that one's going to get interesting. There's a little interdepartment rivalry building there. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is setting up to be, I don't want to say complicated but this 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 whole plot's got a lot of twists and turns in it you know it's got a lot of different things to focus on which is kind of cool because i got a feeling it's all going to come together you know boil up to a head and and we're gonna this is one thing that i like that rogue one and um um now andor framed up really well is this this fight is as much empire versus empire is empire versus rebellion right so like there's so much infighting in the empire oh yeah i mean it's it's alluded to in in george's films right sure you see little bits of uh needling at each other right but this what they've done in rogue one and uh and now here is really bring it to the fore. Yes. I have to say it reminds me of a, a, a quote that I've, you know, learned from, uh, it's a, it's an author from a little way, ways back. Uh, this guy's name is Jerry Pornell, right? And he calls it his iron law of bureaucracy. And I'm going to butcher it, but to paraphrase says an organization will start out with good intentions once it reaches a sufficient enough size 
the bureaucracy, the leaders of this organization start to concern themselves more with maintaining the organization than with doing the good thing it was originated for. So, you know, now the empire wasn't started out of good intentions, but, you know, everybody in there is more concerned with the bureaucracy, you know what I'm saying, than trying right. to do good by the citizens or anything, you know, or or just, you know, do their job well, you know. We got a good example of that in the first episode of Andor, you know, make up a story how those two guys died. Right. You know, so. I mean, that guy knew the game, right? Exactly. Exactly. If, if, if Karn would have just made up a story, none of this would have ever happened. Right. I mean, they wouldn't have stamped anything out, but yeah, you're right. They, they'd still have a job. Yep. They'd still be sitting on their perch. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is cool. This is cool. I, I, I like, I like how they're doing this. Yeah, totally. Well, <laughs> I think that's about it, huh? Well, a couple small things. A couple small things, okay? Uh, one, the 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 computer on Luthen's ship, it's not exact or anything, but it, it just reminds me of HAL 9000. So. Right? I mean. Yeah. I mean, it's, I... Full disclosure, never seen 2001, okay? But we all know the voice of Hell 9000, right? Yes. So it's it just reminded me of that a little bit, just in its tone and in inflection. So I just thought that was kind of funny. And then the other one was, uh, <laughs> you're bleeding on my floor, you know. <laughs> it's like, I love that kind of thing. It's like, you're injured, so, you know. Yeah. Just clean it up. Right. <laughs> yeah, when you get that sealed up, it's you're just, leaking. Just, yeah. Just uh, made me laugh a little. Yeah, that, that was good. That was good. Oh. Yeah, so. Also, Luthen. Okay. Uh, I, I like the little shot of him getting ready to go out on Coruscant where he gets himself in character. Right? He puts on oh, the wig yeah. and the clothes. He looks in the mirror. Gives it that smile and points. It's like, okay, yeah, got to get myself in the right frame of mind here to go out and yeah. act a certain way. You know? It's, oh, I really did like that, too. Yes. Right? And and the way he switched between those two personas right. in the gallery. Yes. Oh, we didn't. You know what? We didn't even talk about my Mothma at all. Oh, I know. I know. I, it's, I, I'm already... Loving what I'm seeing from Mon Mothma. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, it's, you can see she's she's playing this dual role, and it is stressing her the heck out. But she knows she has to do what's right. So it's, I'm liking this. <laughs> well, I, I, I got to ask, too, that, like, so how dry she is later on, right? Her delivery, all that stuff. Oh, oh, you mean in like Return of the Jedi? Yeah. Yeah. Um what do you make of that? Because like she's kinda dynamic, right? In this. Yeah. There's emotion, there's liveliness, there's Right. And when you get there, she's just almost monotone and I mean, I guess it's just being beat down by this, right? Yeah. And I guess they're already kind of setting that up. Because she's feeling the pressure. Right. You know, she said she felt she was under siege. Yes. Exactly. And it's and it's little things, right? Like, she's assigned a, a different driver, right? Right. She goes into the bank, and all of the employees have changed. And she knows what that means, you know. It's, yeah, you're being watched. You're being, uh, it's a, it's like, how much of that can you put up with before you crack, right? Right. You know, and that's and that's exactly what those who are putting these things in place are looking to do. You know, 
So that's 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 the kind of stuff I was I was looking for out of Mon Mothma, and I'm loving that we're seeing it already. Mm-hmm. Even the dinner party that uh, Perrin was is setting up, you know, or reminding her of, and you know, <laughs> we talk about uh, uh, trade routes. <laughs> being cut off and stuff it's like oh here we go this is the stuff everyone hates it's <laughs> yep i dig it though oh yeah I, I i really like that it was trade routes too because yeah, yeah that's a the, that was the political firestorm from episode one right? exactly so, yes like, oh back to trade routes right no it, it's really cool i really like i really like how she's portraying this character Yes. How it's written. Like, I, I really like what they're doing. Yeah. Um, I do, I do really hope that we see kind of that evolution as it goes on to her kind of dry and almost like, uh, stiffened up. Right. Right. Personality. Yep. I'd, I'd like to see what drives that because like i said her, her character so far has been kind of dynamic right well that's the face she has to put on for politics right you know she got to put right. on the show got to put on the happy face for all the other politicians but you know behind closed doors get down to business you know right so there's a definite duality in the character that i think is going to be brought out more and you know when she's addressing the Rebel Alliance, things of that nature, she can be all business at that point and not have to put on her political face. Well, I guess the the other thing that's probably going to steer her personality that way, and, and, and I don't really want to use the term make her colder, but kind of make her colder, right? Yeah. Is the fact that as this goes on, she's going to be making decisions that are going to get a lot of people killed. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, I think that's going to wear on her. And I think that's what we're already seeing, right? She's showing concern for those involved. Right. It, it, absolutely. She talks about that with the whole dinner party guest thing. And, you know, people are dying because of these trade routes things. And she has a concern about that. She, that, that upsets her. Right. And you're right. She's and, going to have to make decisions that actually gets people killed for the greater good of the galaxy. You right. Know? I, I mean, like I said, this is a, this this personality we're seeing right now is a far cry from just going, many Bothans died. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So get out there and <laughs> rah, rah. <laughs> Go blow up some Death Stars. Yeah. Like That was a weird way to remind us all that. Most of us are going to die. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. The, and it's, it was different than I expected it. I'll say that. Yeah. Different, but I like it. I like where no, it's heading. Yeah. I like it. It's, it's going to show what war does. Right. All right. Well, if you have anything to add to the conversation, you can always email us show at the wars it's the best way to get a hold of us. We're also on social media. At The Wars and More on Twitter. Facebook.com slash The Wars and More. At The Wars and More on Instagram. You can find all that and all the ways to find the show over at TheWarsandMore.com. Uh, any final thoughts this week, Doug? No, I think we about covered it. All right. We will talk next week. Next week.